Karen Burns, and today I'll be giving a presentation on policy reform and wrongful conviction. So, Martin Luther King once said, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. Despite that, well, you guys can't see that. Okay, so can anyone define snitching and what the problem is with it? Just your definition. Talking to somebody? Oh my God. What'd you say? Talking to somebody? Talking to somebody? You was gonna say that? Talking to somebody. Talking to somebody. Okay. Let me see. So snitching is when someone gives out information in order to receive a shorter sentence in law enforcement. Um, so usually sometimes they get charges dropped against them or a sentence reduction based on what it is. Or they probably get promises. Um, they are given promises if they tell on someone. And in some cases people are wrong, wrongfully testified against and whatever and they are wrongly convicted. Okay, come through this. Okay, so did you guys know that more than one out of four people get wrongfully convicted and later exonerated due to DNA evidence? The reason for the conviction is because of false convictions or incriminating statements. So, do anybody, can anyone tell me why people confess the crimes they did not commit? Well, I know this one. <laughs> so they don't, get, they don't get a long time in prison. You know, they don't want to take like the, what's that thing called? The yes. maximum time that it would come with them with the trial. A sentence reduction? Mm-hmm. Yeah. I agree, it's usually a sentence reduction. Sometimes lying to the police officer. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Is there any other ones? It's a lie. Mm -hmm. Okay. No, why uh, do people confess the crimes they did not commit? So if you was in um, a room and then the police, police officers were like um, questioning you about your whereabouts and stuff like that, and it was just like, oh, well, I know you did this, I got the information. Um, if you don't tell me, I'll give you like 45 years and I'll make sure you never see you the light of day. Like, why do people confess the crimes they did not commit, even though the law enforcement are telling them this? It could also be because they're trying to avoid snitching. Mm -hmm. sure. Try to avoid snitching. Intimidation. Mm -hmm. Intimidation. Mm -hmm. Okay, so basically, these are some mm -hmm. misunderstanding, mental impairment, ignorance of the law. Some people do not know their um, their rights right off the bat. Um, the fear of violence. So in a neighborhood, the police come and they be like, oh, tell me about this person or whatever. Like a huge time drug dealer, you're not going to tell him because you're afraid of the consequences. So basically, usually when police officers threaten you in um, the room, they actually, they don't, they don't have no um, power to give you that much time, like it's nothing that they can say. And a lot of people don't know this, and they just they just confess to the crime because they feel like if they confess to it, the police officers will actually give them um, a lesser sentence and whatever. So that's why that happens. So law enforcement versus civilians. Officers tend to threaten those who are being um, interrogated with a harsh sentence in order for them to give information. Usually the informant does not know his or her rights and she will make deals with the police officer in order to get a sentence reduction. So this basically ties back into um, um, not knowing your rights. So basically also people in a neighborhood, this is commonly found in low income neighborhoods, so police will ride through and then based off give people they know, they will actually set them up. So if it, if it was like, say, a young guy who they don't really know about, but they know that he's connected to some other guy, they will bring him in and want him to confess something about the other person. Even though if it's not entirely true, they just want something on him. So let me see the next one before I give you guys this story. Okay, so um, 
quota or justice. So everybody knows that uh, officers are required to meet a quota every month. Usually it's, it's given within a certain time period, but it's usually it's in the month. So that's basically the minimal amount of tickets or arrests that have to be made um, for police officers for their productivity. And they, they refer to it as productivity goals, but it really is a quota that they have to meet. Um, so is this justice? Okay, so before I give you guys, um, telling you guys what this book is about, I'll give you guys an example. So, we had an exonerate come and talk to us a couple months ago, and he was basically telling us his story. So, what his story was, um, he was having some um, complications with the cops, or whatever. It was this one officer did not like him, he knew him though. So, basically, um, he was trying to get do anything to get him locked up. So one day it was like it was something about a girl was found dead, and and the police officers knocked on his door. And he was in the um, house with his girlfriend playing cards, having a good time. They told him he was under arrest because someone um, claimed that he was connected and he the one who murdered the lady. So he spent all this time in jail. He spent all this time, and basically what happened was um, someone transported her body over to where he was um, convicted at. So what actually happened was she was from a different county with different, you know, officers, in, different officer department or whatever. And what basically happened was she was mentally ill, so the people who was taking care of her were ripping her off. So the state did not know that she was dead. She was actually a Jane Doe, but they kept on receiving her checks. So that's how they had actually got caught up. And then it was um, her husband actually confessed to murdering her. And they did not know the connection because it was two different police departments, two different counties. They didn't know about each other. So um, he spent so long in jail, I, I believe, it's 2016, I believe he was released in May, and I think he got in there in 1999. So he was basically, he was basically exonerated based on DNA evidence, and because the husband actually told the police officers what he had actually did to the lady. He was like, I murdered her, blah, 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 giving them evidence, but they did not believe him because they said he was mentally ill. So they just let him go off, like he didn't, he didn't even get in jail based off that. So basically this book, um, it's about criminal, criminal informants, and it gives real sources, and it, it provides real detailed stories, um, and it also gives you things that you can do in order to prevent this from happening. So, so <clears throat> in the book, it was a Walker versus Snyder case. So basically, James Walker was convicted of a crime he did not commit based on false evidence John Snyder had provided to him, well, provided to the police. So um, the author noted that in the study, the police had evidence that Snyder was lying, but he had the evidence from the court. So Walker ended up spending 19 years in prison before he was exonerated due to the DNA evidence. So this is our snitch law for the state of Illinois. So in Illinois, um, informants will be inclined to a background check. Um, history of like credit or what have you done in the past. Also prosecutors um, must provide the information like the deal that was made. You know usually prosecutors provide deals and who's around, when and where the statements occurred and etc. So basically you have to go through you have to go through a um, like a period whereas you prevent yourself to the court so they can um, they can determine whether you are reliable informant or not. So basically when this happens, they'll say yes or no if this person is reliable and if they're reliable, they'll go, they're, they can go on to prevent their um, statements to the court and then if you provide us there, you know, in the stand or guilty. So now with this actually being the, the law for the state, it's easy to be manip um, manipulated. So prosecutors often hide information from the courts. Like in the previous um, example that I gave you guys, you can see that prosecutors hid how they knew that the person was lying, but still tried to put that guy behind bars. So it's, yeah, it's easy manipulated. So let's see what we can do about that. 
So I wanted you guys to watch this, a little snippet of this uh, video. of this book on the innocence movement so are often the result and understands that the phenomenon of wrongful convictions is not the result of a few bad cops or a few bad prosecutors. Rather, the causes are at the core of the criminal justice system. Wrongful convictions are often the result of the practices of good police officers who are employing accepted techniques of identification and interrogations that they've been taught and are tra well trained. They are the result of police and prosecutors responding to the public demands that they arrest, convict, and hold responsible someone in the aftermath of a horrible crime that shook the community. They are the result of police officers getting tunnel vision, focusing on only one possible suspect, and therefore failing to fully investigate a crime. They are the result of prosecutors who are more responsive to the societal and political demands that they secure, secure convictions rather than ensuring that they are convicting the right person or securing justice. They are the result of police and prosecutors and judges who refuse to admit that they or the system made a mistake. They are the result of defense attorneys who are overworked, unresourced, or unqualified to investigate the issues and represent an individual charged with a serious crime. And they are the result of our society and our government failing to fund adequate resources for those without sufficient means who are charged with serious crimes. And finally, they are the result of a systemic overt and subtle classism and racism that perpetuates our society and our criminal justice system. Now, we've been able to discern some of the specific causes of wrongful conviction by studying the cases of those who have been exonerated to see what went wrong. And several patterns have emerged. The New York Innocence Project website offers a discussion of the six main causes. Eyewitness misidentification, unvalidated or improper forensic science, false confessions and omissions, government misconduct, informants or snitches, and bad lawyering. Now, we're going to examine the scientific issues next week. This week, the four videos um, that are part of this session will examine the other five issues. Now, I just want to say a word about two of the leading causes of wrongful convictions, witness misidentification and false confessions, because these are the hardest causes for the general public to believe. Most people think that if a victim or an eyewitness to a crime identifies an individual as the perpetrator, that seals the case. We believe this, even though we all know that human memory is frail and inconsistent. Experts have identified that the primary reason for witness misidentification is because of the fragility of memory and procedures that the police use in having victims and witnesses identify a suspect. These methods include the use of live and photo lineups conducted by an administrator who knows which one the suspect is. The administrator, the police officer, may unwittingly or purposefully offer clues or re- Okay. So that's where speaker just of that. Okay. So before we go to the next, um, before we go to the next slide, uh, YouTube video, I want to share with you guys some things. Okay. So the use of criminal, the use of informants or jailhouse informants has been commonly used um, to convict to convict inmates in Illinois. The procedure has become too commonly used when law officials are looking for evidence. According to the Northwestern University Law School, in 2004, a study estimated that false testimony from criminal informants accounted for over 45% of all wrongful capital convictions, which makes informants the leading cause of wrongful convictions. Some wrongful convictions even led up to capital punishment. 
So the snitches or informants are people who testify against an individual due to information he or she has given to law officials. Informants are prone to testify, especially when they are a part of a low-income family. Snitches get paid or even get reduced a lenient or reduced or lenient sentence if they cooperate. Many officers will sometimes exaggerate an inmate's sentence just so he or she can tell them information. Um, or their arrest can um, lead to assault. The arrest for someone can be very dangerous upon families. <coughs> so there are many young age people who isn't really educated on the law and their rights, which makes them an easier target with law enforcement. There was a case where a teenager was involved in a drug case. Okay, so this case happened up in Missouri a couple of years ago. So um, a teenager was, you know, brought in for a drug usage. Um, the police pulled her and her friends over and found a bag of marijuana. The officer used the girl to, um, to her advantage by threatening her with a bigger sentence. So in Illinois, marijuana is illegal, but if you are found with under a certain amount of grounds, you are obligated to just pay a fine. In Missouri, that wasn't the case. So the officer made a deal with her that if she tried to bust down um, a drug dealer, help them bust down a drug dealer, she get a lenient sentence or the charges will be dropped. So she agreed to it. And basically, she went undercover as um, a person to go buy drugs. And when she got to the drug house, um, they noticed that she was um, she was basically, um, you know, what's the word for? Basically, the police was using her to bust them down. So basically, what they did was they killed her, and it wasn't, you know, the police didn't have um, it wasn't really their fault because she agreed to it. So it's basically like she set her up for that situation. So that's basically what happened. Um, okay, so I'll get back to the PowerPoint. So this is an actual message from um, an exonerate. And I'll just play that for you guys right now. I mean, you'll win the case, but 
Um, when the exonerate came to talk to us um, a while back, he's been out for a couple of months. He won the case, of course, because he was exonerated due to the DNA evidence, but he still did not receive any money because the state doesn't have it. So there's so many people out there who was exonerated, who sued the state, but didn't have anything. But honestly, at the end of the day, all that, you can have all that money, but you will never have all that time back. So, let's go to legislative proposals. So there are many legislative proposals that focus on disclosing the informant's identity a little more than it actually does right now, but it doesn't provide much evidence as to how we can fix the problem. So I just want to ask anyone, how do you feel we can change the problem and get rid of this? Um, maybe put more legislation on the way that police officers interrogate people, let them have a little bit more rules that they have to follow within. So, um, and then probably giving more information to the masses, also as well, informing them and having police officers have certain restrictions of things they can and cannot say, which are just like, yeah, you're interrogating, but that's like too much. It's misleading. Think about what she said. You could also just make sure that these suspects are educated on their rights mm -hmm. and make sure that, or maybe even that something in the law firm somewhere, you have to educate, really educate these people or suspects on their rights before they are interrogated. Yeah. Okay, so I don't know if you guys really just, you know, tackled what I just said, but I um, um, I guess it, it's hard right now because it affects government agencies and costs a lot of money. So usually, um, if police officers was given, um, they were given to have DNA, um, you know, DNA um, evidence to prove if this person did or did not do it, it would cost a lot of money. So I think that's why it's kind of, they usually rely upon um, informants mostly. Um, but I do feel like Illinois can pass a budget that will be like, you, you guys know um, that they have to fund, you know, uh, K through 12 education. It should be a bill that says that a certain amount of the budget goes to this for this reason. So, yeah. Okay, so a call to action. What can we do? What can we do? So you can register for marathons with the uh, Innocent Project. Um, they do have a lot of um, marathons that go on throughout America. Um, so if you register, you know, um, when you register that money helps the Innocent Project um, get money so they can get other uh, wrongfully tested people out of prison. Um, lobby days at the Capitol. So, um, the, the Innocence Project actually have a lot of lobbies that you can join, that you can help at the Capitol and talk to these legislators to make these bills and so this problem can get fixed. Also a social media awareness. You can hashtag Innocence Project, hashtag um, free the wrongfully convicted. All these hashtags does exist. The Innocence Project actually does have an Instagram page. I was just on it. And then you can also inform others, like I'm going to say, whether it's the presentation, social media, just educating someone um, on their rights will go a long way when they get um, rocked this. So, are there any questions? I have a question. Yes, what's your question? What would you prefer that we do uh, to call to action? Do you prefer that we uh, get a marathon or What's your personal choice in you to do something that you do? What would I do? Um, <clears throat> I'll do a marathon. I think it'll be fun to do with friends. Um, and it is especially like if you and a group of friends are very influential on campus. You can, um, that's basically educating others. Also, take a picture after the marathon. That'll educate others on social media. But honestly, I feel um, educating others 
high, like going to high schools, different high schools, and educating on them on what they can do and their rights and about this issue. Mm -hmm. And also, um, social media awareness. Because, I mean, we have lots of friends up on social media, so if we just put one post up or a status or anything, that's basically educating your friends, like thousands, hundreds of friends up on social media. So I just feel like all of them kind of tie into each other. But when you present to someone face to face, you're actually educating them more about it. Thank you. Thank you. Is that because you look at them right here? Is that because like you look at the face to face and then you want more because you look at them face to face, or is it because you're why is that? I feel like, I don't know, I feel like you have a greater impact with someone when you face to face with them. Then like on social media, where people are probably like, like your picture just because you're in it or you're doing some good, instead of like, you never know if they'll read your status, they'll just skip over it. So just, um, yeah, face to face, contact, yeah.